And there's a multiplicity of ways we've lost the importance of the, the apostles. And by the way, if we only do that, if the, if the church of Christ is only a welfare program, it will be loved. Can you imagine? Here's a hundred people around him. If I don't touch him before he gets in that boat, I won't be healed. Misunderstanding ministry, Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 21. We're continuing our series through the gospel of Mark, uh, and that is um, the gospel in troubling times. And um, we remind ourselves as often as we can that Mark's gospel is a retelling, as it were, of the apostle Peter's message. And so Mark apparently was very close to Peter, and, and so he was led by God, the Holy Spirit, to write down uh, this inspired account of the gospel after Peter was crucified upside down by Nero, the Roman uh, Caesar. So I believe that it's very clear as we read through here that um, Mark's gospel has a very subtle emphasis. And that emphasis is that though Peter has been martyred, Paul has been martyred, and that the Roman government is pushing its boot down upon the church, the infant church of Christ, the gospel will continue to thrive because Christ is Lord, and the gospel is the power of God to salvation. So uh, it's a powerful, powerful message and presentation of the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Today, though, we're moving into chapter 3, and we see in here a consummation of a section that scholars often call the um, conflict narratives. So uh, we've seen who is Jesus, and then we, uh, th and that he's the Messiah, then we move into this section where Jesus begins to be rejected or suffer conflict. Um, chapter 3, we see the rejection part. Chapter 2 and part of the early part of 3 has been the rejection stage, I mean the conflict stage. And so now we're seeing in 3, the more I study it, the more sermons I see. So I don't know how long we're going to be in chapter 3. But this morning, if you will, look in verses 7 through 21, and we're going to think about misunderstanding ministry. A church was in need of a pastor for some time, but was having trouble getting one, but not because the pastors weren't applying, but because the congregation always seemed to find fault with the pastors. Most pastors were rejected when the people just read the resume. Some didn't have, have enough experience, some too much, some not enough education, some too much, and so on. You've heard the joke that uh, as long as you're uh, 30 years old with 25 years of experience, you know. Uh, <laughs> So one day an elder who was getting very tired of this decided to do something. So the next Sunday he went to the pulpit and announced that he had important resume to share with the congregation. Many of them sat back, folded their arms, and began to listen, ready to, what, to find fault with what, whatever they could in the new applicant. The elder began to read, quote, Dear Pastor Search Team, I am writing to apply for the position to be your pastor. My experience is more along the lines of an evangelist, but I believe I could fill your position very adequately. I've traveled around most of my life, renting and doing odd jobs to support myself and preaching whenever I was in, or wherever I was invited. Churches, streets, even jails. 
As a matter of fact, I've been jailed several times and been involved in a few public squabbles. I've been accused of being an anti-Semitic, an anti-authoritarian or anti-authority, and involved in a, uh, and causing a few disturbances almost everywhere I go. But I did, have a conver- I did have conversions to Christianity during my ministry as well as a few healings. Thank you for considering my application. Most of the people looked up at the deacon with smirks of condemnation while others chuckled out loud. Does this guy, or one of, one of the men stood up and said, does this guy actually expect us to seriously consider him for our pastor? Just what's this fellow's name anyway? The elder replied, well, it's signed the Apostle Paul. You know, a lot of our view today, if if Paul or the Lord Jesus or any of his apostles were to walk into many churches throughout the world, they themselves would not be accepted. John the Baptist always jokes said, uh, by saying he didn't wear a heart shafter and Mark's suit. You know, he wore a uh, leather girdle and, and a uh, covering of camel's hair. So he wasn't exactly uh, putting off the, the um, professional vibe. No, but we can say this because many times we misunderstand what ministry really is about. We laugh at such things. Because as ludicrous as they sound, there is a germ of truth in it. The ministry of the gospel comes with being misunderstood. Now by that, of course, you know, I throw out that as a, a little joke. doesn't mean that churches are, um, that are always in the wrong here, okay? Uh, Brother, Brother Horace can tell you about <laughs> receiving tons of resumes and not being willing or you know not most of them not being very good so I understand so that's not what I'm pointing out here but but the differences of of what we expect and what God's ministry really is not just for ministers but for all church leaders for elders and deacons for Sunday school teachers and just Christians Christian parenting all, if we're going to serve Christ and minister for him, there's always going to be some misunderstanding uh, by those around us. Um, our Lord himself experienced this to a great degree. Uh, in fact, I would say a greater degree than any minister or member of a church ever could. We first see that the masses themselves pressed him They pressed him. And why did they do that? Well, they did that because they misunderstood him. In verses 7 through 12, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed. Notice, as John says, when they're believers or disciples, it's one thing. But oftentimes, the distinction is made. Are they disciples or are they the crowd? Because... This right here is a congregation, not a crowd. And there is a distinction. But these were crowds, and they were coming by the thousands, we're we're told, from Galilee, from Judea, from Jerusalem, from Idumea, and from beyond the Jordan, and from Tyre and Sidon. Now, maybe you're not really familiar. You could... Most Bibles have a map in the back if you want to look. But essentially, if you can picture in your mind the Mediterranean Sea, just kind of think of a letter C backwards, (laughs) the Mediterranean Sea, and along the edge of the Mediterranean is the uh, nation of Israel, just kind of a sliver of land. There is the Jordan River that's coming uh, on the other side of that, and it will flow uh, into the sea or great lake of Galilee, and then eventually into the Dead Sea, which is further south. Then across the Jordan, which is known many times as the Transjordan, that's the 
area across from there, which in the Old Testament would be Edom. Today, we would say Jordan, that area. Here he refers to Idumea. Idumea is Edom. This is where the great rock city Petra, if you ever heard of Petra, that is inside a canyon carved literally out of the stone. That was the Edomite capital. And during the intertestamental time between the Old Testament and the New Testament times, there were many wars, and Edom was conquered by the uh, Judean kingdom and was renamed later Idumea. So they're coming from across the Jordan. Tyre and Sidon are up north off the Mediterranean, right above uh, Israel, what would be known as the land of, of Israel. So, but basically, these are all communities where there were large numbers of Jews living. Uh, so they're coming from all of this region by the thousands, gathered to basically touch Jesus. In verse 8, it says, When the great crowd heard that he would, what he was doing, they came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. Now, forgive the comparison. Uh, I don't mean any irreverence by it. Only familiarity. Uh, if you can think of the... Um, the Beatles and Elvis and these people who, who had to have bodyguards, they had to have gates, they had to have people to push the crowd back because of the insanity of people trying to pull off a button or a, yank their hair to get a piece of hair or a piece of their clothing or just to touch them or take a picture, these kinds of things. Well, this is a, a that's a, maybe an example, a poor one, I understand, a, an example of what our Lord was dealing with. Except put within that, not just fascination. Uh, not just people who, you know, are in love with the Beatles or, or Elvis or think he's good looking or something like that. I saw that uh, some newspaper said that the police had to come out because Taylor Swift was somewhere, you know. And, and I thought, who cares? This is newsworthy, but this is where we are in modern, modern culture. This is what we idolize, and, it, and I do mean that word. But in this time, put yourself in these people's position. There was no medical care. There was no insurance. If you fell and broke your leg, more than likely... That will seal either your life or it will cripple you for the rest of your life. There was no one to help people. Sickness, disease, birth defects, uh, accidents, and on and on. There were hundreds of thousands of people. Very few people were completely well. And so when you hear... There is a miracle worker. He is healing people by the thousands. He is healing them just by touch. You remember when Jesus was traveling from one place to another and the crowd was all around him and one lady was able to touch the hem of his garment and she experienced healing. And the Lord, the Bible says that the Lord stopped and said, who touched me? And once again, the disciples misunderstood him and said, well, Lord, the people are all over you. They're thronging you. How can you ask who touched me? But Jesus sensed virtue go out of him and heal this woman. This kind of thing. So thousands and thousands are coming to him. Once again, we observe that our Lord Jesus healed a person in a crowded room. That's our last week's study. Experienced conflict with his enemies, then retreated to the sea. Maybe you haven't noticed that pattern. But here again, Mark 
has this pattern of telling us the story, and it relates back to the gospel in troubling times. It, it shows the wilderness experiences of Christ. It shows many of these metaphors that even geology it has in the narrative. The sea is both a kind of wilderness and a place of ministry. It is at the sea that he casts out the unclean spirits from those possessed by them, and that he heals the sick and the handicapped. It is at the sea that the masses find him. And why do the great crowds from the farthest regions of the Jewish community seek him out? To be healed. To be healed. Now, before I go too deeply into that part, I just want to, to take notice for a second. We are so used to he hearing about what Jesus Christ did that we are heretically numb to it. His compassion, his love, the way he poured out himself Thousands of people coming, hurting, hungry, blind, maimed, diseased, demon-possessed, unclean spirits. Why are they unclean? Because they're unholy. These are fallen angels. They are unholy themselves and they possess, seek to possess people and to control them and through them encourage them to do unholy things. They're unclean spirits, not ghosts, demons. I don't personally believe in ghosts. That's it's just a footnote, all right? I don't believe there is any such thing. I think there are demons who pose as people. But we'll go into that some other time. Why do these crowds... Father, follow him to be healed. And did he lecture them? Did he shoo them away? Did he? No. He, he healed and healed and healed and healed so much that multiple times we're told by Mark that the disciples and Jesus were not able to eat. We see Jesus in the boat at one point and in the middle of a Galilean storm, which are known for being sudden and very dangerous, Jesus is asleep to the point that the, the disciples themselves have to go over and wake him up in a storm on the sea and say, Master, do you not care that we're perishing? How tired do you have to be to do something like that? I just feel like we need to revisit the cost that our Lord was paying. They know, uh, they know nor care little about Christ's person, his teaching, or his mission. They simply press him, or not meaningfully, not purposefully, crush him that they might touch him and be, receive healing. It's not an organized congregation. It's a hysterical mob. Can you imagine? Here's a hundred people around him. If I don't touch him before he gets in that boat, I won't be healed. And why did the Lord have a boat? Lest they crush him. So what he would do sometimes is get in the little boat and push out from the water, and the water would act as a natural stop for the people. And they would gather on the shore, and then he would sit in the boat and teach them. Did he want to heal them? Yes. But was it all about healing? This is where so much of the charismatics and, uh, you know, get this wrong. The gospel is not about healing. Now, does God heal? Yes. I think he still heals people. I don't believe in faith healers, but 
I think the Bible is clear that God heals people through the answer to prayer. Jesus and his disciples did do these kinds of miracles, or his uh, apostles. Often those who aspire to the ministry of Christ's gospel are overwhelmed by the press of people. Usually this is not on the scale that our Lord experienced, but it is exhausting and discouraging nevertheless. Biographer Ian Murray points out how that once C.H. Spurgeon, the pastor of the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London uh, that averaged 5,000 on uh, Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings. You had to have a ticket to get in. Not, it didn't cost you anything, but you did have to have a ticket to get in. So it's first come, first serve because there was just not enough seats. And that was during the time when there were no such thing as mega churches. I mean, this was a very unique situation. When C.H. Spurgeon entered a meeting with his wife-to-be and was immediately swept away by hundreds of people seeking to talk to him so that she was left standing alone. And if I remember that story properly, her mother was with them and her mother said, are you able to bear this? In other words, if you marry this man, you better get used to it because you're going to have to share him. He's going to be swept away from you over and over and over. The fields are white to harvest, and the laborers are few. And any member, elder, deacon, Sunday school teacher, evangelist, missionary, pastor, diligent church member, who goes out to begin to do the ministry of Christ will be overwhelmed. And oftentimes it's not for the gospel itself. It's for what they feel that you can do for them. There's been many times that I've been counseling and I get to the scriptures or get to the gospel and then the person or the couple is done. They didn't want any more. What did they want? They want to be healed emotionally, relationally, without Christ and His Word. George Whitfield crossed the Atlantic a dozen times and preached up and down the eastern territories of, the, of America, traveling by horseback. He preached in the morning, the afternoon, in houses, streets, church buildings, and coal mines, and even from his bedroom window to slaves who gathered there by night. He preached to a crowd that had gathered around the house where he slept before he went up to his room and died. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 21 through 23, or 33, we see the Apostle Paul says, I'm going to say something to you, Corinthians, when he speaks about ministry. And he says, it's to my shame. I'm embarrassed to say it, but I must say it. We were too weak. But whatever anyone else dares to boast, Paul says, I speak as a fool. In other words, I'm saying things that you've backed me in a corner to say. I don't want to say these things about myself. He says, but I also dare to boast like the false teachers who are accusing him. Are they Hebrews? He says, so am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. Am I talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death? Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift in the sea. On frequent journeys, a danger from rivers and danger from robbers, danger from other own, my own people and danger from Gentiles, dangers in the cities and dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers from false brothers in toil and hardship. Though many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst, often with foot without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, 
there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, He who is blessed forever knows that I am not lying. At Damascus, the governor under King Artis was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped by his hands. This is the life of an apostle. Thank God it's not the life of a preacher. <laughs> Usually. It is some. I remember Adoniram Judson reading about how he was sleeping on the steps at, uh, of a Buddhist temple in the middle of the night and being surrounded by people he knew were robbers and praying that God would not allow them to come and rob him. The crowd came, and for, what, for that we give praise, but they did not understand why they were receiving such powerful blessings from him, nor did many of them care. Many will come to church, and we need to be careful, don't we? They come to church for a multiplicity of reasons. Maybe they are having trouble. Maybe they're having financial trouble. Maybe uh, they're having physical trouble or marital trouble or who, who knows. Maybe God is convicting them of their sins. Maybe they want to know more about Christ. Who knows? But we receive them so that we can preach the truth to them. Maybe their initial motives are wrong just like these people. But it behooves us to give them the message. Yes, we can put clothes on them and feed them. We'll do what we can to aid in whatever way we can. And the church should always be ready to do that. But if we have only done that, we have fallen short. And by the way, if we only do that, if the, if the church of Christ is only a welfare program, it will be loved. But if the church fulfills its calling to be the preachers and proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, then even though we feed and clothe and care for multitudes, we'll oftentimes still be misunderstood and despised just like our Lord. That's okay. That's all right. We're in a fallen world. We're in a sin-sick world. That's why we're here. Number two, the twelve concerned, concerned him. The crowd pressed him, but the twelve concerned him. You know, he says here that he went up into a mountain. Now, he was on the sea. Remember what we said? That's like a wilderness and a place for ministry. Now he goes to the mountain. We're not told what mountain. We're not told where. But we are told it's a mountain. There's a change in elevation. And we're meant to understand here that the great things often happen, the elevated things often happen on a mountain. And, and so we, we are to understand that something very important even more important than healings, teachings, and, and uh, exorcisms is about to happen. Here again, this is something the church of Christ in our day has lost sight of. The importance of the apostles. And there's a multiplicity of ways we've lost the importance of the, the apostles. One of which is to proclaim apostolic succession through many little apostles or the one that claims to be the apostle of Christ sitting on a throne in Rome. There are no more apostles. These were the only ones except for Matthias and Paul. After that, there were no more apostles. But in like manner to Moses, when overwhelmed by the work, he established elders and judges in the covenant community of Israel to help with the work of the ministry. Jesus now appoints the twelve to aid and to carry on 
the ministry of the gospel. Although I plan to come back to the calling of the twelve. This is another one of those messages that I really believe we need to bear down on uh, in more detail. But I, I want to give us consideration uh, in this context because I believe it's one of the things that Mark is pointing out. That although he pulls out 12 disciples, 12 what will become apostles. They're not apostles right now, but they will become. And even in that group, there's a lot of misunderstanding. And we might say even disappointment. First, let us pay close attention to the geographical change. The Lord Jesus went to the sea, Capernaum, after confronting his critics by, but when he calls and appoints the twelve, he calls them to him upon the mountain. The sea often carries the idea of evil, the raging of the crowds of unbelievers. Even Satan, who is called in the book of Revelation, the dragon who comes up out of the sea. What is the sea? Well, metaphorically, the sea is the masses of unsaved, rebellious Mankind. The sea is, represents the Psalm chapter 2. Why do the nations rage and imagine a vain thing? And what is that vain thing? We will not have this one to rule over us. We will not have their chains, the believers in Christ, the believers of God's word. They feel like God's holiness chains them. They want to be loose from that. Let us cast their cords from us. So this is that raging sea. And it often carries the idea of evil and the mass of humanity in re rebellion against God. Whereas the mountain, like the man, of Mo man Moses, carries the idea of a place of spiritual closeness to God. Jesus preaches a sermon on a mount. He goes to the Mount of Olives to pray. He ascends back to the Father in heaven from the Mount. In this, position, in this portion, we witness another profound, important thing event happen in the New Testament, and that is the establishment of Christ's church, the calling and the appointment of the 12 apostles. Perhaps you ask, Pastor, how, do, how does this fit the premise of misunderstanding ministry? How does Jesus calling 12 disciples fit into misunderstanding ministry? That's a good question, I believe. Probably the most painful part is that we read in verse 19, at the end of the list of the apostles, it says, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. Notice how personal Mark makes that. He's not called the betrayer, which other places he is. Here, the one who betrayed him. I believe that's the connection. Probably the most painful part of ministry is betrayal. One of the tri 12 betrays Jesus our Lord. The English reformer William Tyndall was betrayed by his one and only trusted friend. Tyndall was having uh, a meal with this trust, a one and only trusted friend that he had. And as his friend said goodbye, walked out of the cafe, he told the soldiers, it's that man sitting right there. Same thing Judas did. The man that I kiss sees him. During the pandemic, when congregations were illegally forbidden to gather, there were pastors and churches that did it anyway, as the law and the scriptures do actually allow. Some of these pastors were arrested and fined and jailed for holding worship services. So that's not so surprising when we think of how evil the world is. What is shocking is that many, maybe even most, 
of those ministers of the gospel who were arrested and churches were shut down were reported by members of their own congregations. Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 8, the Apostle Paul speaks again of some of his betrayals. He says to Timothy, Do your best to come to me soon. I wonder why he says that. Well, listen. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Cretius has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he's very useful for me in the ministry. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak, my coat, that I left with Carpus at Troas. Also the books, Mike, it's in the Bible. Paul said, even bring my books. Just want to point that out. He says, and the books and above all the parchments, which are either blank or copies of the Holy Scriptures, Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me. This is in a courtroom. But all deserted me. May it be not laid to their charge. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it still on message. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom to, be the, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul, the apostle of Christ, who labored more than any other, who wrote three-fourths of the New Testament, says, I stood in court and all had deserted me. Demas, my companion, decided to go leave Christianity and go back into the world. I've sent messengers out to do more work for the gospel so that now I'm just here alone with Luke. Would you bring Mark? And by the way, it's cold. I need my coat and I only have one. And would you bring my books and the parchments? And, oh, yes, and watch Alexander the carp coppersmith because he has done me great harm and he'll do it to you because he's opposed what? The message. The message. Betrayal. That's a hard one, isn't it? It's a bitter pill. But you know, preachers aren't the only ones that deal with that. You had family members that turn on you? I've said before how, I, how when I was saved at 17, you know, I'd been in the heavy metal scene and all that stuff. And I trusted Christ as my Savior, and I, I was so gullible, I thought all adults know that I was a horrible person. So I'm, I know they're going to be so proud of me now that I've trusted Jesus, and God is going to change my life. I'm reading the Bible now, and I'm praying. So I started just telling everybody. And boy, did I find out real quick that being a Christian had nothing to do with being an adult. There were just as many lost adults as there were lost teenagers. And they didn't want to hear it. They weren't even happy that God had turned my life around. They wanted me and my faith and my Bible and my Jesus to get out. Number three, his family pitied him. This is shocking. And we just mentioned it a minute ago. But the Bible says here in verse 20 and 21, then he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. So he went home to have a meal and the crowd followed him. And so they couldn't even eat. So Jesus feels compelled to go out. I'll say this. If anybody that's called into the ministry, you better get ready and used to cold food. Amen, Joyce? How many times have you cooked a, a wonderful meal and you wanted it hot and warm, but Pete couldn't make it? 
Amen? That's the way it works. Labored over the meal. But the ministry calls. You'll have to eat that later. You know, so you better get used to cold food. That's all right. At least we got food, huh? And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he's, uh, he's gone mad. He's lost his mind. Did you know Jesus' family said that? Do you expect that all of your family will rejoice at your faith in Christ? Do you think they will support your call to the service of the gospel? And I don't just mean preachers or missionaries here. I mean your service as a believer to serve Christ as Lord and King. You think they'll all support that? What about when it conflicts with a family get-together? Or when it doesn't agree with a family habit or ritual that predates your conversion. Now your religion is getting in the way of our family. Luke 2, chapter 20, uh, 41 through 50, 52, we see that there is a, there's a history of Jesus' family, even Mary, even Mary whom some set on some really high pedestal, most of the time did not understand what Jesus was doing. And I'm not saying that Mary was an unbeliever. I totally believe Mary was a believer. I just think that she's a mother. She's not a prophet. She's not deity. She wasn't virgin born. She, none of that stuff. She was a godly, simple woman. And she loved her son, but often did not understand what he was doing, even as the son of God, even knowing how he was born. We see that when he was a child, he goes into the temple in, in Luke chapter 2. And he's, while they're there, he's listening to the teaching and asking questions. And the clan goes away and realizes Jesus is not with them. So Mary, go, they go back, they go looking, they find him. Mary finds him. She says, can't you just see this happening? Jesus, what are you doing? Do you not realize we're all worried sick over you? We thought you were with us. You ever been lost? Did your parents ever lose you somewhere, like at a mall or parade? Scary. Okay. Well, but Jesus wasn't lost. They thought he was lost, but he was right where he wanted to be. Okay. So she starts chiding him, and he says, Why are you surprised? Shouldn't I be about my father's business? Is that a subtle way of saying, Mother, remember who my father is? I'm not Joseph's child. She even says, Your father and I have been worried. Joseph might have been his legal father, but Joseph was not his biological father. And was Jesus not maybe gently reminding her of that? I don't know. We see later at the wedding at Cana, they run out of wine. She comes to Jesus. They're out of wine. Isn't this bizarre? What's Jesus supposed to do? Run down and get some wine? She's expecting a miracle. But she's doing it really, at the wrong time. And Jesus even says, has my time come? In other words, you're not respecting the Father's plan here. But he did it anyway. And it became what's known as his first miracle. Jesus in Nazareth, the people said, well, isn't this jo Mary and Joseph's son? Aren't his sister and brothers? and all that? Don't they all come from around here? Who is this guy claiming to be a Messiah and a miracle worker? You see, this has been normal that his family has not understood him and has not supported him. Even David said in Psalm 27, Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, Seek my face. My heart says to you, Your face, Lord, I do seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O oh, you have, who, who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not. 
I said, well, preacher, why do you read it like that? Because of the last verse. For my father and my mother have forsaken me. But the Lord will take me up. Ever been rejected by your father and your mother? Is there anything any worse? So what are we to conclude from this line of reason from Mark? Well, I think several things, two things in particular, that we should take home with us. One is Isaiah 53, 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and one as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and not esteemed. Jesus was a man of sorrows and grief, and why would he not be? The Son of God, the Holy second person of the Trinity, come to this earth to save sinners, a judged world, condemned people. Why would Jesus be laughing and joking? We don't laugh in a fire. We don't laugh when we're in a car accident and people are lying on the road. No, Christ comes a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And all those that follow him and do his ministry will taste sorrow and at times grief. Isaiah continues and says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Was he just having bad luck? Did God just want to punish him? No, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought about our peace. Because we've all, like sheep, gone astray and turned every one to our own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then secondly... I understand the gospel. The real gospel and the real Jesus is not popular. But he does invite you to come and be saved. Luke 9, 23 through 26. And he said to all, if anyone come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Not a pretty gold hanging cross or some cross earrings or, or a nice cross bracelet or any of that. No, a Roman cross, an instrument of death, of suffering, of shame, of guilt. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you in the, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit at the glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has, and here's us, that was the, the disciples, here's us. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands, for my sake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last. Jesus says, the gospel might call you away, and it might cause you to be misunderstood. It might cause you to lose loved ones and relationships because you have to bear the cross. But he says, you'll receive a hundredfold and eternal life. Do you know Christ? Is this the Jesus and the gospel that you know? Is this the Jesus you serve? Oftentimes we're serving because we want adulation. We want recognition. Not necessarily in the evil way, but just that we expect it or we want, want it as a person. But part of that may just be our cross. That as he was the Son of God, the Lord of glory, 
despised and rejected. So we, his disciples, his children, may also experience rejection by the world and many who we love. Do you know Christ? Do you know this Christ of the gospel? Are you serving him? Let's pray. Our Father, we Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to our latest video. Go ahead and click that little thumb so you can like that video, as well as on the bottom right hand corner, click that little bell to subscribe and receive notifications. Thank you again so much for tuning in, supporting our video ministry here at Cognitive Church.